Welcome friends, lesson number five. So, we have established that Satan wants to rule the universe, but not just does he want to rule the universe, he wants to be in the position of God. He wants that throne, and so he's wanting worship with the rulership of the universe. This is what he wants. And now, what we're looking at is we want to find out how he thought that he would achieve this. What was going on in his mind that he was able to overthrow his creator, the God of the universe. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's really an insane thought. But we want to have a look at what happened. We want to investigate the evidence. And I do believe it's going to help us. Remember, the question we want to try and answer is, why is there so much sin? Why is there so much suffering? Why is there heartache? Why do bad things happen? Why is there so much evil in this world? And why does it seem that God doesn't care? Why does it seem that God is not acting? Why does it seem that he's not interested? God is very interested. God is all-powerful. And God loves you more than we'll ever know. He loves you more than his very life himself. So what is going on? We are still investigating. And I'm very excited because I believe today, this lesson... And the next lesson is going to, boom, it's going to explode and we're going to see things that maybe you haven't seen before. And once you see it, you'll never unsee it. These are the foundations that we're setting so that we can understand the Bible. From here, my friends, I know it seems like we're going a little bit slow. But once we have these foundations right, that we have a cosmic war, we have a rebellion in the universe that God has to take care of. He's stuck with a coup d'etat attempted coup d'etat and he is taking care of this situation he has a plan and the bible shows us that plan and it's so exciting to unveil and to reveal that plan and i'm we're going to do that in these lessons but you and i are caught in the crossfire you and i are collateral damage in this cosmic war that's going on and so let's investigate today we're going to be looking at what actually happened in the universe exactly how he thought he would accomplish this. This is the challenge for this lesson. Now, before we do that, there's two things I want to bring out, uh, maybe three. <laughs> the first one is names in the Bible. Names in the Bible are, because remember, this is a 101 class. So if you're a seasoned Christian and you think this is elementary, yes, it is elementary. It's supposed to be elementary because this is to fill in the gaps where people who don't know the Bible whatsoever can get the basics and the foundation of the Bible. So please be patient if you're a seasoned Christian. The names in the Bible are described with the nature and the character of the person. So it's in the Hebrew culture, as in many cultures, the name means something. For example, we have Esau and it says there, and when he, the first of the twins came out, we have Esau and Jacob, remember, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau which means rough to the feeling so he came out all hairy and all rough so they called him rough to the feeling right they called him Esau there's also name changes because of the characters or because of what's significant in their life so Abram was high or exalted father and when God made covenant with him I believe it was Genesis 17 he changed his name to Abraham which is father of a multitude, which was part of the covenant, right? He would be a father of a multitude of nations, a great multitude like the sand is of the sea and the stars of the heavens. And so the, his name changed. Jacob, who came out after Esau, he was holding onto his brother's heel. He was the second of the twins. And he was, Jacob means heel catcher or surplanter and deceiver. And we'll study that definitely in the future as well. It's very important. But when he overcame with God and he wrestled with God and he wanted forgiveness with, from God and the peace with God, that God is with him, he was changed to Israel, which means overcomer with God, one who struggles with God. So names are really important in the Bible and names change when meanings change. For example, another example here, this is when Jesus said, this is how you should pray. After this manner, therefore, um, pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Now, what does that mean? Hallowed be thy name. The name of God represents his character, who he is, his reputation, his steadfastness, his mercy, his love, his patience, his forbearance, his provisions, his grace. All the wonderful things that we love and worship about our God is summed up in his name. So when we start to pray, we hallow his name and we praise him for who he is. I hope that makes sense. So we're looking here in Isaiah 14. We've looked at this already. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now that's the first and only place in the whole Bible that you'll get that word, hey, Leo, in It sounds, this is how you say it, hey, Leo. It's not how you spell it in Hebrew. And the Lucifer is actually a Latin word. It's not Greek, it's not Hebrew, it's not technically in the Bible, but it's a Latin word that, which means light bringer. The real interpretation really is morning star. But Lucifer is kind of stuck because he was the light bringer. As he would go into God's presence and then he would come out of God's presence at the very throne of God as a covering cherub and then he would administer God's government and he would bring that righteousness and that glory of God and he would bring the light and the character of God to the, the rest of the universe and then go back to God again. So he was the light bringer. However, when he changed and iniquity was found in his heart and he began the rebellion in heaven, he withstood against God, he opposed God. The very word to oppose or withstand, that verb in Hebrew in the noun form is Satan. So that Satan means the opponent or adversary. So you can, sometimes you can maybe even use that, the adversary, instead of saying Satan, because then it can mean more in your, in your language. And when you're speaking to each other, you can say, we have an enemy, and that is Satan, the devil. He hates all of us. Never forget it. And it's mentioned 19 times in the Old Testament and 37 times in the New Testament in the King James. The, the second or the third <laughs> thing that I want to bring out, we live in a physical world. And at the fall, at the Garden of Eden, we lost our spiritual nature. We lost the Holy Spirit at the fall. And so we no longer can see the spirit realm. We can't see angels. And we've lost that. So how is God going to teach us about things in the spiritual realm? Well, God being a great teacher, no, the best teacher, he has used, He uses typology. And he uses what we can see as a reflection. And he says, okay, you see that? Right, now I'm going to teach you about the things that you can't see in the spiritual realm. Does that make sense? Now there's examples. For example, the, the sanctuary. God said to him, said to Moses, Moses, make me a sanctuary. And he gave him exact dimensions of everything that must happen there with the covering cherubs at the throne and everything, the dimensions, the materials, everything was very specific. And then we read in Hebrews that that miniature that was made was actually a model of the real and the heavenly sanctuary. And we really need to understand that and we will. We will do a series on this. Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9 will tell us there that this was a type of the spiritual. The next thing as well is that the prophets of Israel and Judah, the prophets of the Old Testament, sometimes prophesied to other nations, to kings of other nations. Definitely there were a lot of prophecies about other nations, but sometimes they were specific to the kings. God would say, go and prophesy to this king or that king. And here we're having a look at two examples we have Ezekiel 29. Son of man, he's speaking to Ezekiel, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus says the Lord God. So he has a message for the king of Egypt. Behold, I'm against you, etc., etc. Now, that's one. What about Jonah? Jonah prophesied to a Gentile nation. One of the nations, Assyria, and it actually was the city of Nineveh, right? So God does that. Now, this is the city of Tyre in Phoenicia. Phoenicia is on the coast. It's on, just on the north northwest of Israel, bordered on Israel. 
And that's it in uh, modern days. Those are Roman ruins of Roman baths after the Grecian Empire. And there we have it there. You can see it in the north. That little yellow dot there, that's Tyre, which was the capital of Phoenicia. They Obviously, they bordered on Israel and they had a lot of dealings with Israel. They knew very well about the God of Israel. And the king of Tyre was very helpful with King David at the time of building the temple. They were a port town, port city. And this is important. They were trading and they were traders. And so they made a lot of money in their trading. They were very well known. You must have already heard, I'm sure, about the Phoenician ships. They were famous shipbuilders. So this trading brought a lot of business and a lot of wealth to that area. Now, let's have a look at what Ezekiel prophesies. We're going to just run through it very briefly because we're not going to read everything. This message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give the prince of Tyre, or the king of Tyre, this message from the sovereign Lord. In your great pride you claim, I am a God. I sit on a divine throne. What? So this this king was lifted up and he thought of himself as a god. Like he's he's just, there's no power over him. But God says, but you are only a man and not a god. And then at the bottom there, with your wisdom and understanding, you have amassed great wealth from all the trading, right? In Tyre. And here we go. I'm just going to go through the, the, the highlights here. By your great wisdom and trade... You have increased your riches, like I was saying in the trading port. And your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Because you have set your heart as the heart of a God. That's the second time now. You think you're a God. I mean, seriously. And you shall die the death of the slain. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you weren't circumcised, you weren't part of the old covenant. And if you weren't part of the... Included in the covenant, you couldn't go through the sanctuary and you couldn't sacrifice for your sins. And so dying the, as an uncircumcised meant you died in your sins, which meant there's no redemption left for you at that point. So this is kind of giving a final death to this king of Tyre saying, you know, you, you've, you've gone point, past the point of no return, it seems. You'll die the death of the uncircumcised. Now, my point is, this is the physical and this is the scene. Now, God is teaching us here. See, that's the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 28. Now we go to the next 10 or next 9 verses and to the spiritual and the unseen. I'm sorry to interrupt this lesson, but in order to keep the lesson sizes around about 10 minutes or so, this lesson will be continued on the next video.